So, right, we're going to get started here. I'm going to take a seat. Uh, and I'm going to start with Rita. So this is a session on advanced nuclear, not your grandfather's nuclear. Tell us what, okay, that's a, that's a nice glib thing I've said. What does it mean? <laughs> So advanced nuclear is focusing on technologies that are not yet commercialized. Uh, generally what's out there right now is light water reactor technology where water is the primary coolant. Advanced technologies are looking at different types of coolants including molten salt reactors, high temperature gas reactors, as well as liquid metal cooled reactors such as sodium or lead. Okay, so that's the technology, uh, but what does it do? What, what, what are the benefits? So, so the because you're using those different types of coolants, you are operating at lower pressures in some cases. You have a smaller footprint, which means you have a smaller emergency planning zone, which means you have fewer uh, folks that you need to operate the plant as well. So you have enhanced safety, lower cost, and higher energy density in some of these technologies. Okay, that's a great pitch. Um, Simon, you're running a company, you founded a company that's mm -hmm. trying to deliver all of that. Do you want to talk about uh, Talk yes. about that. Tell us. Explain. So um, um, we founded Terrestrial Energy in uh, five years ago, and we're looking to develop an advanced reactor. Um, our reactor system is a molten salt reactor, so very, very different compared to the commercial systems that we've seen in the market for the last 50, 60 years. What's interesting about advanced reactors is these are not new technologies. They're technologies that reflect half a century of effort at the national lab level. What is new today, though, is that you have entrepreneurial-led companies that are looking to commercialize these technologies. So what's new is taking these technologies out of a lab and putting them in the market. And these entrepreneurial companies are doing this uh, because they believe that these, these new systems, these very different systems, give you a much more cost-competitive position in a competitive energy market. Try and elaborate a little bit more um, about you know, what is your solution? What does it look like? How big is it? Yes. And also, where are you in the development process? Yes. Right? Assume we know nothing, because it's approximately okay. uh, uh, true. Right. Well, it's, uh, except, except, except for me, obviously. You know? okay. <laughs> so we have what's called a small modular reactor. It uses a molten salt uh, um, a technology. 400 megawatt thermal, 190 megawatt electrical. It's small and it's modular. The intention is to manufacture the components, the modules in a factory setting, uh, and assemble them on site. Um, in terms of where we are with the, with the development, we, we, we have an industrial design of our integral molten salt reactor power plant, and we have uh, been undertaking for the last three to four years an engineering program. We're in engineering. We're undertaking an engineering program to move this design through the regulatory channel. Nuclear industry is a heavily regulated industry. It's probably the most heavily regulated industry for good social reason. But we're in that regulatory channel. In October last year, we completed the first phase of the regulatory process in Canada offered by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. They have given their first opinion on, on our, our reactor design. I'm going to pan it back to you. Oh, I sh I, we should have a round of applause for the oh. Canadian <laughs> regulatory innovation there. So that is the... That is the first advanced reactor that has achieved that milestone um, within the uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So, um, yeah. so the CEO of EDF, um, the, the, the bit that in the UK, the bit that's um, responsible for Hinkley, the huge old technology plant, right. um, he very rashly said at one point, I think in 2007, he said by 2017, um, you'll be cooking your Christmas uh, turkey using electricity from Hinkley. Um, it's after 2017, it's now probably more like 2027, <laughs> if at all. When are we going to be cooking our turkeys with terrestrial energy power? Well, um, uh, we're on a, a commercial p uh, pathway to deploy first systems by, uh, in North America, our, our home market project is Canada, looking to deploy first systems to cook that first turkey um, next decade, so towards the end of next decade. Okay, so it might be... Thanksgiving, if it's the, if it's in the U.S. or, uh, or <laughs> exactly. something. So, so you yes. said within the next decade. Within the next decade. Okay, so I'm going to calculate because I'm fast at this. That's 2028. 20, it's towards the end of next decade. So you, yes. you could race EDF's Hinkley plant for the first new nuclear cooked turkey. Uh, exactly. For, for I mean, some, that's, that, 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 that's looking like it's on the cards. Excellent. That's, that's, I, I, yeah. well, we're going to runners and riders. We should take odds on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, advanced nuclear versus not advanced nuclear. What do you call the not advanced stuff? 
The, cu the current fleet. Oh, that's very politically uh, wise, rather than old or, or, or whatever. Right. Okay. So, um, Caroline, same for you. Can you describe Oaklo? Uh, you know, what, what, is, what is it? What does it look like? Where are you? Uh, when's, the, when's the turkey going to be cooked? And so on. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Caroline Cocker, and I um, was the co-founder of Oaklo Inc. What we're trying to do is a small, very small nuclear reactor to power remote areas. Uh, so when I say very small, I mean between one and two megawatts, so very uh, well-sized for really remote areas. There's a lot of really unique things that our reactor can do, but a lot of advanced reactors can do using advanced fission technologies, um, such as ramping up and down, um, being able to actually consume existing nuclear waste. Um, of course, we provide emission-free power, and these are things that some of these remote areas have been desperate for for a long time, so that's, that's our passion. I think a lot of people wonder, it's, it's just like what Sa Simon said, which is, um, you know, these aren't necessarily new. These technologies have been really well proven over decades of experience, and they've done incredible safety tests on them. They essentially cannot melt down and things like that, but people are like, well, why wasn't this commercialized before if that's the case? And I think one of the themes of this whole conference is really looking at what, what an inertia is there in, in the energy system or in large companies in general and trying to really disrupt that. And for various reasons, there's so much inertia, especially in the nuclear industry, and part of it is because of the regulation and that there was really no motivation to implement a lot of these advanced technologies, even though they were really well proven. One of the things, a couple of the things that really motivated ours in particular is the development of microgrids and the importance of microgrids, as well as these microgrids now care about being emission free instead of burning a lot of diesel. So those two things kind of really came together to make people really want to have these in their communities. Okay, that, that's great. I mean, it, and it's hard to think of a less traditional nuclear power station than a one or two megawatt uh, solution. Just give an idea, um, what will it look like? I mean, will it be on the back of a truck potentially? Or, I mean, it, because one or two megawatts is, how, how big is it physically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the idea is it could fit in a container-sized uh, container, like a traditional shipping container. Um, it would be put underground, and it's never refueled while it's in the field. So you put it out there for 10 years, it produces emission-free power, you pack it back up and take it back to the central facility. One of the neat things, too, is that we can actually recycle our fuel. So the fuel that it, it uses, it can go out for 10 years, we take it back, we recycle it, send it back out for another 10 years, and you can actually do that for up to 70 to 80 years. And then at the end, because it's so efficient with the fuel, you only have waste that has about a 300-year half-life before it's back to natural levels of radiation, which is another thing people aren't really familiar with, but you know, there is natural radiation. It's, in fact, probably one of the most natural things that all life has evolved around since forever. So that's, that's kind of the size um, and the implementation. Our idea is hopefully you don't really see anything. It doesn't really disturb the natural environment hardly at all. Okay, thank you very much. And, um, and I think you, you're the, uh, the first person on this panel, probably not the last, to use the immortal world's what people don't really realize is. That's your cue, Eric. <laughs> what do you do? How do we get this done? How do we, get, how do get, how do we accelerate these sorts of solutions, um, which to be you know, completely clear, that they are zero or near zero carbon, and um, huge contributors they will be to uh, uh, addressing climate challenge if they can be built. Uh, and how do we, but how do we get it done? How do you, and how do you contribute to that? Ah, uh, well, you know, I, I got my start into nuclear after hearing the story of what is possible with some of these advanced designs. So not only providing low cost electricity for communities around the world, uh, but also doing things like desalinating water on a, on a scale we have not done before. Uh, things like manufacturing carbon neutral synthetic fuels using uh, high temperature steam and electrolysis. Um, and once I heard that story, uh, I, I quit my career as an opera singer <laughs> and uh, started to, to pursue nuclear. And uh, in that same way, I, I know that there has to be hundreds of thousands of people out there uh, looking for uh, a purpose that, that are passionate about the environment, that are passionate about climate change, and that if they only knew what is possible with these advanced nuclear designs, uh, they, would, they would join the cause. Um, so how, how that works at, at our nonprofit is a, a, a few different ways. Um, 
Uh, one of which is we're trying to actually gamify nuclear advocacy. So we have a, a mobile app called Atomic Action, and uh, people uh, get points, they're awarded points uh, for doing things like calling their senators and uh, weighing in on an important piece of legislation, uh, for, for tweeting at their elected representative and saying, uh, hey, we, we need this technology, uh, please support this bill. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways we do that, by trying to use technology to, to augment and, and amplify uh, our efforts. Um, and uh, you know, another way, we, we actually ran a canvassing program uh, in Ohio last summer where uh, we talked to uh, over 12,000 people about nuclear energy. And that, that wasn't even advanced. That was just uh, you know, your grandfather's nuclear. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that part, those two, two nuclear plants in Ohio provided 90% of the, the carbon-free power in that state. Uh, you know, over 4,000 jobs and uh, something like 26 million in school funding. Nobody knew that. So once, once they became aware of all those benefits, uh, it was a, a game changer on, on their level of support uh, to keep those operating. I think we'll come back to some of those sort of use cases. Um, but let's, let's spend a bit of time on the difference between, you know, I, I've characterized it as your grandfather's nuclear, uh, and, uh, and I don't think that we should be disrespectful because right now, as we speak, it's producing more zero carbon electricity than anything else, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. In, in North America, in Europe, uh, nuclear energy is the largest source of uh, carbon-free power. Uh, if you go worldwide, it's number two, because there's, there's obviously a lot of hydro out there. Hydro, um, yeah. Yeah. And with wind and solar catching up fast, et cetera, let's take yeah. that as red. But, but that's, that's vital, because I think, um, is there any way that we can hit, does the, do our panelists think there's any way that we can hit a two degrees uh, climate scenario whilst shutting down the existing nuclear power stations as too many countries are doing, revealing my bias. Yeah. <laughs> Simon. Well, I'll make a quick comment on that. The, the you know, evidence to date indicates that if you unplug your existing workhorses of clean power generation, your, your nuclear power plants, and you unplug them early, you're going backwards with respect to trying to achieve your climate mitigate, your greenhouse gas mitigation targets. So the um, uh, nuclear is currently the backbone of clean energy provision. It's been the backbone for the last 50 years. It's going to be the backbone of, of, of clean energy provision going forward. Um, and that's because uh, you know, nuclear has probably more clean energy muscle than anything, anything we know. But the, the key question, I think, is what technology? I don't think the, the, the current workhorses rep represent the future that bright future of clean power generation using nuclear, nuclear energy. So, uh, it's interesting because, okay, I revealed my bias that we're not gonna achieve climate targets if we're shutting down existing mm. nuclear, but you revealed yours, which is that nuclear beats renewables was sort of packed into what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you wanna, uh, do you wanna elaborate on that? Do we just have um, a panel on yes, renewables? Yes, I, I could elaborate on that, and, and, I, and I may hijack you with two slides here, actually, Michael. Oh, excellent. <laughs> they didn't warn me so, about this. Let's have some slides. How do we do this? Okay. Right. <laughs> so this is, this is why nuclear has to be the backbone of clean energy provision going forward. And by the way, this doesn't include other technologies, but it, 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 it shows that, um, that nuclear, uh, nuclear has a you know, unique, unique property in addressing the problem. So this is, our, this is our challenge. This is our challenge for humanity. Um, and uh, the challenge has got two components to it. First is meeting uh, COP21 greenhouse gas targets, 80% reduction in greenhouse uh, gas emissions to reduce climate change by under 2%. Um, the amount of clean energy required is about 200, uh, about 200 terawatt hours. If you also define the better world as one where energy poverty uh, is removed. Simon, I'm going to cut you off okay. because I can't read that and I don't know if the audience can read it. Can we switch the slides off and you do it, um, the, the, you know, do, just talk, explain okay. the point okay. without the, if you, if you okay. don't mind, it, I, I'm sorry world, to do this. The best, of the, the best world um, in, in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation, we have, a, you know, we have a clean world and one where energy poverty, which is very serious today, is addressed. That requires 400,000 terawatt hours. That's three times today's fossil fuel basket. Fossil fuels today represent 85% of primary energy demand. Okay. You need something that's three times the size of fossil fuels. Okay, so the thing, when, yeah. I don't want to get into a debate about yes. 
uh, that's the numbers unique... and primary energy being 68% waste and all those sorts of things. Um, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to go yeah. back to where I spoke yesterday, and I briefed yeah. you behind backstage about this thing, the, the, the three-third world, um, which is going to be one-third uh, variable renewables, uh, wind and solar, because they are two to four or five cents per kilowatt hour, and they're available now, and they're going to be built over the next decade, right. and it's geometric. Um, I, I mean, I guess if you don't accept that, then it's sort of difficult to, but, but, it, but that's where we're going. Um, IEA says 20%, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, one third. And then there's going to be all these electric vehicles and lots of batteries everywhere and a more efficient world. Mm -hmm. um, because when we get in debates about, about you know, how to bring uh, electricity to those people who've got no electricity, you're not building, well, actually, Caroline, you might be building nuclear power stations in, in Niger or in Ethiopia, um, but I don't think, Simon, you're going to be, unless I'm wrong. So, so uh, let's step back. Uh, let, let's, let's step back, because I think we, uh, we're going to get yeah. to a section I want to take you through um, about how do we get society, what's the best way to promote nuclear? And the topic of is it best to say it's better than renewables, is that the best way to get it done, is a topic I want to cover. I don't want to, I don't want to go into early. What I want to do is facts. I want to know what the economics of this is. I want to know the regulatory process. And maybe we should start. Um, uh, Rita, you've been sort of, well, you've just watched the, the tennis match there. Um, talk, talk us through how do you get this to regulation and how are you trying to speed that up? How are you trying to get innovation to market more quickly? So my role is as the gateway for accelerated innovation in nuclear for the United States Department of Energy. And what we are trying to indeed do is get technology developers to a more rapid and cost-effective commercialization of their technology. And the way that we're doing that is also engaging the regulator along the way, which uh, has not been done uh, over the past few decades uh, in this manner. And what we do is engage in the United States, it's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, we engage with them to apprise them of what the developers are doing, as well as now they have turned around and they have every six weeks public stakeholder meetings where the public can come and attend in person or tie in by webinar to understand their updates to regulations and policies. And then in turn, the NRC can also hear from the public as well as you know, developers are part of the public and hear on uh, the developments that are occurring there. So when the design is ready for uh, certification and, and they apply to the NRC, it's not something being thrown over the wall. You've communicated in parallel during the development process. But you're, are you sort of acting as an intermediary between what are now dozens of entrepreneurs, not just a few big companies, and the nuclear regulatory uh, bodies? That's one of my That's roles. One of, right. um, all of the developers are also, and, and more, more importantly, on their own working with the regulator directly. Um, I'm trying to represent d the different communities. And so one leg of what I do is a regulatory interface. The other is to provide technical expertise to the development community. And the other is to provide financial assistance. What could the regulators learn from what's happening in the space industry currently? You know, they've gone from sort of a, a NASA monopoly to these incredible entrepreneurs you know, landing rockets you know, on, on floating barges and uh, reusable and doing extraordinary things, lowering the cost by two orders of magnitude or whatever. I mean, is it, is it fantasy to think that that could happen in the nuclear space? Is it happening? Is it, it, it's, it's starting to happen. Uh, it's a different regulatory body, but it's starting to happen. Um, and I would say that... It, it is a difficult, different... Reg I, it's not, rockets is not nuclear, I understand, <laughs> but it's the analogy. Yeah. Right, but also... Um, the regulatory body in the United States is also looking to other regulatory bodies, including Canada, um, and applying lessons learned and best practices. So they're not operating in a vacuum either, and I think that's to their credit as well. So, Karen, is, that, is, there, is there something to be learned out of the sort of proliferation of, of rapidly moving entrepreneurial businesses in space? Is that something that inspires you? Have you thought about it that way? It's definitely inspiring. Um, we look to some of those things where they're some people in Silicon Valley call it hard tech or whatever. It's not just an app. It's like you're actually building something that's really hard and doing that. So it's, it's incredibly inspiring. If I could go back to your earlier question, though, um, there, there's no either or in, in clean energy, right? Like we need all of it. And even people ask us about is there competition from this, that, or the other. We need so much clean energy. I think that's what Simon's getting to is, is 
we need all of it, and we needed all of it yesterday. And so that's that's our goal too. And each thing is going to have its own niche. Like solar is going to have like small communities and can start unfurling you know solar panels really rapidly. And then nuclear will take longer in some cases, but then it'll be a bigger step change. And so I think that's really the answer to that. But also that it, co countries that have rapidly de and deeply decarbonized have done it with nuclear. And so I think you use all of the above to really hit those climate targets you're talking about. So, so that's an exposition of a different, I mean, that's a, again, coming to this question of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, instead of positioning nuclear versus renewables, that's the opposite position. And it's clearly one that, that, that I, uh, I like to see more of and I try and work on seeing more of. I want to just, um, let's, let's, talk, let's stick to the, the, the data bit in a sense. You're both going to be uh, generating electricity uh, cooking turkeys in 10 years, and I'm not quite sure when, um, but um, how much will it cost? Uh, let's start with Caroline. Have you, could you do uh, cost per kilowatt hour of your solution? And then Simon next. Yeah. Um, so the real goal is to really beat what people are paying now for electricity in these areas by a substantive margin. So what we're looking at is in Alaska potentially saving them over 50% of what they're currently paying, or they're being subsidized to pay. Um, uh, and it's a similar situation in the Northern Territories and Canada as well, where these people are either paying astronomical fees or being heavily subsidized or both. Um, so that's uh, really what we're looking for is huge cost cutting and hopefully making their electricity greener. Um, some studies have shown that advanced reactors that are well vetted, um, the studies are well vetted and the technology, but um, can reach uh, $2,000 a kilowatt. Capex. That's the construction cost. What right. does that translate into in terms of um, yeah. my utility bill? Right. So, like, like I said, like in these areas, we're trying to cut their cost by a substantive amount. Um, in some of these areas, they're they're paying over a dollar a kilowatt hour, and we can really reduce their costs. Um, but we anticipate that we can get down below seven cents a kilowatt hour within you know a, a okay. near term. N near term. Yeah, within like after we've done probably about between ten and twenty units. Okay, Simon, you've done a lot of work on the costs. Yes, we have. Yeah. I mean, our key commercial claim, and the reason we're doing this project is, is, is uh, because it can deliver $50 a megawatt hour. So that's five cents a kilowatt hour. Five cents per kilowatt hour. How many do you need to build to get there? Because I mean, the first one presumably is, um, is, is yeah. more expensive. Well, there the are industrial learning curve effects in all technologies, and there have been tremendous ones in, in wind and solar. I mean, go back 10 years, no one would believe that wind and solar could be competitive. So we think, given that it's small and modular, certain industrial learning curves um, were applicable to us. It's, it's n, equals, n equals 10. So by the 10th system, we think we'll be getting close to, to $50 a megawatt hour. But there's still, you know, we're not looking to deploy one system every year or, or a few systems every decade. We believe the market opportunity of this technology is hundreds of deployments a decade. So with that, we know with that capacity, you can benefit tremendously from industrial learning curve effects. Or indeed even more, because I mean, the, if we look at the, the, the opportunity to replace yes. uh, fo fossil fuel, there's, in, there's enough replacement, uh, there's enough need for replacement, as Caroline uh, says, to, uh, to do thousands a decade, right? Well, yes, and, and even just look at replacing the existing fleet, um, you're talking about many gigawatt hours, uh, many gigawatts of capacity that need to be coming online in the, in the, in the 2030 simply to replace the lost capacity from an aging global nuclear fleet. So, so the economics has a believable pathway to being cheap, cheap enough to, to, to compete with current power prices. Let, let, let's move it, unless you've got a substantive point on that, I want to bring in Eric on safety. How, how, how safe, how dangerous, how dangerous is uh, nuclear? That's the, easy, that's the easiest question of the day. Nuclear is statistically the safest form of energy out of any way that we produce energy. Uh, and it's pretty simple. Uh, when an accident happens, everybody's heard of uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, not that much damage occurs. And we have the World Health Organization, United Nations saying now, you know, several, several years later uh, that, wow, you know, that really didn't have a huge public health impact. Uh, not, not a lot of people know this about Chernobyl. I think the idea is that it became a kind of a, a radioactive wasteland and you know, nobody could, could go there. So the accident happened in 1986 and uh, the last reactor that was on that site was shut down in 2001. So there, there were workers that came there every day because they, they, knew, it was, uh, they knew it was safe, uh, just even you're just right next to it. 
um, and, and they knew how important that electricity would be uh, for, for the area. Uh, so once they finally got to the point where they had uh, you know, built, built fossil generation to uh, take, take up the slack from the, the nuclear, then they were able to shut down the last reactor in 2001. Um, but uh, so nuclear, by, by any metric, uh, several different peer-reviewed studies is the safest. Even safer than, than wind and solar, technically, um, by unit of energy produced, because people fall off wind towers and, and solar panels. So that's, that's one of our, our biggest battles, is, uh, is, is articulating that safety. And now these advanced reactors are, I mean, they're passively walk away safe, so it's just, <laughs> So totally, you got something that's already the safest and it's even safer. So I'm like, I can't wait to the day where I don't even have to answer that question anymore. Hopefully it's in the next decade. <laughs> but safety is not, and, and that needs to be, that's one of the things, not, what was the phrase? Um, not many people, not enough people understand that, that it is safe in terms yeah. of uh, the, the deaths per kilowatt hour, megawatt hour, and so it's just off the charts, along with wind and solar, frankly. They're both very, uh, and they're building solar in Chernobyl now, as I'm sure you know, um, but not enough to replace the nuclear. Um, but safety isn't just catastrophic, uh, f catastrophic uh, events like Fukushima or wind scale in the UK or uh, uh, Chernobyl. It's also, um, it's the supply chain, uh, and it's also a proliferation risk. And I'm looking at you, Caroline, because you've got a little, you've got a thing that is the size of a shipping container. How do we make sure that one of those doesn't um, end up mixed in with the other shipping containers in the uh, in a port? Yeah, yeah there's there's a lot by, of by a bad person who did it on purpose. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot of safeguards by design, and what I mean by that is it's already low enriched, and it's a, a fuel form that's basically completely useless for any nefarious intentions. So if someone wanted it, it's, it's kind of a silly thing to want um, in the first place. But then the other things are, although it's small, it's incredibly heavy, so you'd need a lot of equipment to be able to get it out of the ground. So we're talking 70 or to 100 tons, depending on how we do the, um, the packaging. Um, and then the transport is, is heavily regulated, incredibly heavily regulated, and so there's a lot of different ways in which that's basically a non-starter. But, but I could come back at you and say, you know, Bin Laden was a construction magnate. You know, so he doesn't he doesn't care how heavy the thing is. He, he, he certainly doesn't care anymore. But, um, but, <laughs> but you know, th that's not a very good defense uh, against somebody who really wants to cause uh, trouble. And by the way, they don't have to make a bomb. That's not the issue with something like that. They just have to. They just have to. De a dirty bomb will work just fine if you've got uh, radioactive material in the thing. No, I mean what. Well, why, why, yeah. Tell me why I shouldn't be slightly nervous. Let me, right, yeah. Um, so if, if I'm slightly nervous, a lot of other people are going to be absolutely terrified, right? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. And we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, uh, and we care a lot about that. And that's why we have those things that are built in. So first of all, it's low and rich. But you're, you're asking, well, what if they take something that's kind of not terribly radioactive, but trying to make a dirty bomb out of it. This would be a really hard target to go after. So there's hospitals all over the entire country, and every single one of them has radioactive sources. That would be a much better source for creating a dirty bomb. But if they wanted to go to find this thing that's encased in a really thick concrete that's underground that weighs 70 tons and is also radioactive, um, then they could potentially try. Um, but it would be incredibly difficult. It'd be tracked. We have response plans, security response plans. There's all these things that are built into that that make it a really hard target. And when you make it a hard enough target, then it basically makes a lot of other targets much more interesting. I'm much more concerned, not that we want to talk about things that are worse, but I'm much more concerned about biological weapons, chemical weapons, and other things that are much easier to get a hold of and to transport. But also, if you were to somehow get all, through all of that, break open the concrete, get through all the locks that are involved, steel and all of that, you have a sol what's essentially a solid block of metal, and even if you had a really big bomb, it wouldn't really pulverize in the way that traditional ceramic fields do. So there's a lot of different factors in which make this um, basically impossible. We're kind, of, we're kind of falling into the trap that often nuclear advocates fall into, which is just over explaining how safe it is. We do that so much that it actually freaks people out a little bit. When we're talking about hypothetical situations that are so far-fetched, they're basically impossible. Like, that's uh, terrorism, that's not how terrorism works anymore. It's somebody renting a truck and driving it through a, a, a crowded, you know, 
parade or something, or, uh, or getting a gun in a crowded movie theater, uh, because that's way easier than what's Car what Caroline's describing. It'd probably be easier for you know, zombie bin Laden to build a plane and then crash it into something than uh, hijack a, a tiny nuclear right. reactor. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Simon or Rita, do you want to come in on this on the safety issue? Well, I mean, just continuing this conversation, if you go to a nuclear power plant today, and, and please take the opportunity of doing that, you'll realize that these things are military-grade fortresses. The idea that someone could go in there nefariously and, and tinker it with it, you have not seen the number of armed guards and the number of checkpoints uh, um, no, involved. But to be fair, I, but, asked, but safety, I, I asked Caroline because of two, mega, you know, two megawatt uh, uh, power stations buried in, in remote communities and so well, on. It's not, it's and, not the country. I mean, it's, that's your grandfather's nuclear. No, but, no but those those remote communities will still need the security detail, which is compliant with regulation that exists today. You won't be able to just stick it in there and, and leave it alone. You'll have an enormous armed contingent, and that's for, expensive. For, for one megawatt of nuclear, Caroline? Um, I think that the regulations are, are, are looking to be modernized in such a way that the security that's applied is, is proportional. So one of the examples I give all the time is I went to MIT for grad school. We had a research reactor. My office was right by it. We didn't have a huge military force by it because it was recognized that that's an incredibly small reactor and it uh, has a lot of passive safety. In it. Um, and even actually that one was high enriched. Um, but so, so I think the regulations will be reasonable when it comes to some of that. They won't require us to have 60 guys with guns, just like a large light water, water reactor, I don't think. Yeah. I'd say all, this discussion is just a perfect example of how the fear of nuclear is much more harmful than okay. nuclear but, uh, has Eric, ever I'm gonna, been. I, I, I cut Simon off. I'm going to cut you off as well. At that, at that, just not, I'm actually going to let you continue. But what I'm going to do is frame it and say, but that's... But, I started when I was an when I was when I was studying. I also played with a, a nuclear reactor in, in Cambridge, and I'm a, I studied nuclear. So you're not talking to somebody who is coming at this as in any way trying to shut this down. The opposite, right? But I but the the role here is to try to articulate these issues, and let's move on because we've got about five or six minutes left. How do we get this done from a societal point of view? Because just saying I can explain to you with data why you should not be frightened uh, is not a very good communication strategy, right? We had two bad communication strategy. One is you should stop building cheap wind and solar because this thing that might appear in 10 years is much better. The other one, I'm characterizing, Simon, I apologize in advance. The, uh, but the other one is, um, please trust, the please trust we're the government, please trust us uh, on, on the numbers. I don't know, Rita, if that's, that's not uh, your approach, I know. But um, how do we get this? How do we persuade? You know, how many tweets do you get with all your gamification versus the number of tweets that say this stuff is, is, is dangerous, et cetera, et cetera? How do we turn that around? Uh, yeah, it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of conversations, um, honestly. And you know, meeting people uh, where they're at, uh, you know, they, they don't really care what you know until they know that you care. Uh, that's, that's something that we discovered after you know, having, or well, that was kind of our uh, impression going into having all these conversations uh, with our door-to-door -door campaign, and the, the data proved that out. Um, you, you need to, uh, people, we, we don't lead with the safety case, is, is the short answer, because uh, that, that frames the whole conversation after that, and you'd be surprised on, at how many people it, it doesn't even occur to them. Um, so what, what we would do when we, when we uh, knocked on people's doors and said, hey, uh, this nuclear plant provides 4,300 jobs, 26 million in school funding, and 90% of your clean energy, uh, which, uh, and, and right now it's all at risk of losing, what, what of those three things are most important to you? And the person would be like, you know, the jobs are really important. And then you go, well, why jobs? And then all of a sudden we're having a conversation about it and uh, getting to know each other, and there's a, there's a values alignment, and maybe it's, maybe it's an environmental case. And once you realize that you want the same thing, then the, the rest of the details just kind of fall into place. Can, can we just transcribe that and sort of use it as the, uh, as the blueprint? Because, I, I mean, so I'm not, as chair, I'm not supposed to say, but I, I agree. Um, how, how can we get that, how can we get more people doing that? Rita. So we've actually enlisted uh, Eric to come and talk to Idaho National Laboratory next month to help us communicate in that fashion because you, when, once you target those values, it's a really easy conversation to have versus me spewing how great molten salt reactor technology is. 
many people don't care. They just want to know that when they plug in their iPhone, it's going to work. Do, do we need to shut down some nuclear advocates who are sort of communicating wrongly, who are doing things that switch people off? I don't think we need to shut them down. I think we need to realign. Yeah, that, that is... A, I'm not naming names. It's, a, it's, but, an, on, it's you know an ongoing I mean. question. There's some people on Twitter that, uh, you know, give a resounding middle finger to renewables people. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a very productive way to, to have a debate. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, the reason they care so much about nuclear is because they care about, about climate change. They care about energy poverty. And that's the same thing that renewables advocates want, too. So we got we to realize that you know, we're all humans. We're all part of this big family. And we're trying to solve the problem together. OK, now we've got a couple of minutes left. You've got an audience out there that's got pretty much everybody you need to be working with, probably some extras as well. right? So each of you, perhaps, uh, can, can we just hear what would you like uh, who, who do you need to talk to? How can this audience help you? What sort of people would be helpful to talk to? You've got people doing oil and gas, doing uh, from utilities, electricity, renewables, batteries, uh, automotive, big data, and you've, you've, you know who you've got in the audience better than I do. Uh, and who, who, do you, who could, what alliance would you like to build? And, and, and let's go along from Rita to Eric and, uh, 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 and answer that. Um, energy storage, big data, utilities and policymakers are on the top of my list, I think, who we can leverage to further um, nuclear uh, in a to, to be a bigger part of a diverse energy portfolio. Okay, Simon? Yes, for any big industrial user of, uh, of energy to, my, my appeal is, is to them to have a look at how advanced reactor systems, particularly ours, can fit into their energy needs. Data centers is, is one of them. Very good, Caroline. I'm lucky I get to go before Eric because I think I'm going to steal his thunder. No, I, I think like you've got a room full of influencers here and people who are really uh, educated on energy and just to reach out to other people from what you've maybe learned today or, or learn a little bit more about nuclear and just reach out to other people and that's, that's our key goal like every day because if people don't understand the benefits and the, they won't want it and uh, they won't see our mission the way we, we see it. Okay, Eric? Uh, so I'm an environmentalist and I think a lot of other environmentalists out there think that the only way to address climate change is to run oil and gas out of business, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, uh, so my dream, and I'm, well, I'm you know, thrilled to be here, uh, is to have the conversation and, and talk about how uh, advanced, advanced nuclear and oil and gas have, have a lot of potential crossover. Uh, things like more ec economic and environmentally friendly uh, extraction of tar sands, uh, all the way to uh, getting the oil and gas folks into the uh, synthetic fuel manufacturing business instead. Because uh, I know electric vehicles are going to continue to make a ton of progress, but uh, I, I I'm from a rural area, and I, not, I know a lot of guys that aren't going to give up their F-150 or their 1969 Ford Mustang. So, <laughs> so if they go to the gas tank and uh, fill that thing up, but instead that gas uh, it was, was made out of simply water, splitting water into hydrogen and combining it with carbon that we've sequestered out of the air or out of the ocean, uh, so it's a carbon-neutral fuel, that is my dream, and I feel like some of the people in this room might be able to play a role in that. Very good, very good. So, we're out of time on the panel, uh, but I think we left on a really interesting note, which is they want to talk to people who are in this room, and I hope some of you uh, want to talk to them. I want to talk to Eric about heat, because you talk desalination and you talk about uh, other things. Uh, We've got to talk about heat, because nuclear can also provide heat, uh, process and other. So, um, Plenty of liaisons, plenty of alliances to be, build, uh, to be built, and I think that's the reason that we're here. Uh, only by working together uh, will we be able to really be energy disruptors. Please thank our panel. Thank you.